Um, but once we have ability, we'll, we'll go on the road. Okay. So thank you so much for in including me in this wonderful conference. And if anyone needs to get up and stretch and align their airway like we just saw, please do so. I know that I was trying to sit upright and get everything aligned after our last lecture. That was wonderful. So this last year for me has been, wow, kind of breathtaking. As a sleep medicine doctor, when you're faced with one of your major therapeutic options and it goes through a massive recall, how in the world do you approach that? So I wanted to share a little bit about what we did at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, just to let you know, I'm a proponent of multimodality therapy, and I am blessed to be on the Medical Advisory Board for SoundMed. I've also done some lectures, although in the remote past, for Philips. Um, most recently, um, I presented to uh, CMS for uh, positional therapy uh, to try to get coverage. So I wanted to let you know that up front. So, the past couple years have really been a crucible for us. We've really been through a lot when you're trying to care for patients, and our patients have been through a lot too. First, we were dealing with the pandemic. That really hit our supply chain in being able to acquire what we needed for PAP therapy. Then we were hit with the recall. And we'll briefly go over what the recall is, just in case you're not familiar with the details of it, and how we responded to it at the Cleveland Clinic. And then lastly, you know, we have two major manufacturers for um, PAP in this country, and one of them is having some connectivity issues. So being able to approach our patient population has become quite problematic, and this is what we've been looking at. So yes, it's a Peaky Blinders reference, because yes, I did binge watch it. So our goals for today, number one, I want to share that experience and how we responded um, to the crisis of the PAP recall. And I also wanted to identify other therapeutic options. I've changed the word from alternative to other because when you use that word alternative, it conjures up things like acupuncture and herbs and all kinds of interesting things. Um, but having been a proponent of multimodality therapy for years, we have um, wonderful evidence supporting all of our other non-PAP therapies. So, June 14th, 2021, at 5 o'clock in the morning, I get a text from my colleague, Louis Cazagalas. He's another sleep doc who, he is a night owl. He is never awake, much less texting me at 5 o'clock in the morning. He's like, check Reuters, see what happened. So what happened was, there was a level one recall leveled from the FDA. And now it looks like it's affecting up to 5.5 million devices. And it was affecting CPAP, BiPAP, ventilators, in-lab titration units. And what the concern was is that there was breakdown of the polyurethane foam that was helping keep the machines quiet. And this, in turn, was causing particulate matter to um, be expelled into the hose and then also off-gassing um, from the polyurethane foam. So Philips was required to respond very quickly and there were some concerns about the initial statements that came out. Um, one of those, and rightfully so, um, they warned that if you're continuing, uh, if you're on a ventilator, you really do need to continue that for the obvious reasons. But what concerned us in the sleep field was, was that a manufacturing company was telling someone to stop therapy and then contact your provider. So as a system, we had a problem with that. Plus, we needed to address what in the world were we going to do with these patients. So here was me. Yes, you're going to see my dog periodically throughout this talk. Um, this was me. I had my hat on as a doctor. How in the world am I going to talk to my patient population? However, I got a phone call from someone that said, this is Bob. I said, Bob who? And he said, Bob Wiley. I'm like, Bob Wiley who? Well, he happened to be the CMO of all of Cleveland Clinic, like all over the world, 
just to give you some perspective, we have 269 locations spanning from Abu Dhabi, Nevada, Cleveland, all over the place. So a lot of places. And I went, oh, that Bob. He started peppering me with questions. He's like, you know, I was given your name because you're director of PAP therapies for Cleveland Clinic Home Care. How are we going to approach our patients? Because we need to reach them quickly. We need to have one voice, one message. Yeah, I, I was like, huh? So he started asking me, how many of these units do we have in patients' homes? How many in the hospital? How many in Abu Dhabi? How many in London? And I was like, huh? And so I was just stunned. And I'm like, I'm going to have to get back to you. So fortunately, we were in a lull with the pandemic. So Cleveland Clinic came up with this huge task force to address um, uh, the pandemic and to utilize all of our resources. So he took that entire task force and pivoted it and said, here you go, have a good time. So he laid all these wonderful resources at my disposal. So we very quickly tried to come up with a list of things that we needed to do. So here are the tasks that we had to tackle right off the bat. And we didn't really approach them in a linear fashion. It, this was all going on at the same time. The very first part of this was a risk assessment. So when you look at PAP therapy, we have a body of literature looking at moderate to severe apnea. We know the cardiovascular risk, if not treated. For some people, it's in a more immediate risk, others a more long-term risk. We also know that if you have significant daytime sleepiness related, it puts you at risk when you're on the road, if you're performing surgery, if you're flying a jetliner. So there are definite risks involved. What we don't know and didn't know and are just now starting to get a handle on, what are the risks associated with this particular event? Just to give you a little background, because my history in biochemistry, I just had to delve into this a little bit. What in the world was the substance we were talking about? Polyester polyurethane. So this was something that um, Otto Baer in Germany had developed, and this was back in World War II. This is a picture of Dr. DuPont uh, working here in the United States, and here he's working with unfixed polyester polyurethane. Now this is where the real risk is is when you have something that is not inert. So this is when we're concerned. Now, what all do we have this substance in? It's in everything. Look around you. We've got polyester polyurethane in just about everything. We did stop putting it into internal medical devices. At the time of the recall last summer, I was shopping for a swim spa, and in the upper right is a picture of, uh, I wanted to see what went into the insulation since I live in Ohio, and it gets a tad bit chilly. And guess what? It's lined with polyester polyurethane, so it's everywhere. But how stable is this substance? In general, it's an incredibly stable substance, and you really have to perturb the darn stuff to cause a problem. So the thought that you can have breakdown and particulate matter or off-gassing is like, how in the world does that happen? So these are questions that us, Phillips, the FDA, everyone is still trying to answer. So I'm wondering, what is the perturbation that set off this problem? In the industry, when they're exploring how stable an inert substance is, they'll take it and put it into various conditions. And you've got to do some pretty crazy things to start seeing breakdown of polyester poly polyurethane. You've got to drop it down into deep oceans, brackish water, common theme being moisture. Um, and one of the initial concerns was um, the very small number of people that had reported uh, problems, there was a common theme of using an external cleaner that they put into their device um, that may be one of the causative factors. The word is still out, but some of the initial data is looking in that direction. So at this point in time, this is pretty much how I was feeling. And fortunately, I had a huge team backing me up and we were able to move forward very quickly. 
So these are the groups that were put at my disposal. I was astounded. I had no idea that our organization had this body of people that they could call on in a crisis and could cut through that usual red tape that you find um, in most hospital systems. So I was fortunate enough to be able to interact with these people for a long time, multiple times each day. So the first thing that we needed to accomplish was to identify what patient population we were talking about. Now fortunately, Philips has a very robust database called Care Orchestrator. And five minutes into the mission, on the phone with our representative for the area, um, I was able to get a list of every single patient that Cleveland Clinic Home Care had set up on a device. All their information, boom right then, thank goodness. That was the easiest part of our job. But we had to address HIPAA issues and trying to communicate back and forth from industry to um, Cleveland Clinic Home Care and to the hospital. And what we found is we had about 17,000 affected devices. Wow, and that was just with Cleveland Clinic Home Care. We also have patients that are at outside DMEs. One of the problems that we have in the industry is that Currently, ownership of this data sits with the medical equipment companies. And the medical equipment company has to tag us and label that we have access. So that made identifying that patient population difficult unless the patient reaches out to us. The last bit of problem was the messaging. And one of the messages that we drove home to Phillips on day one was, Please do not directly tell our patients what to do. That requires a set of initials after your name. Number two is we're going to own this message. We will work with you daily. And so we worked very closely with Phillips to assure that there was a very consistent message that went out to our patients. Our next step, uh, Rena Mera is a wonderful pulmonary critical care sleep medicine doctor who uh, designed an, a decision algorithm so that if you were somebody in the system and you were presented with a phone call or a, a message or an email um, regarding a patient, you would know what to do. And so we wanted to put a visual algorithm into the hands of um, anyone approached by a patient or if you're reaching out to a patient. The first section highlighted in red is to be used for um, people without initials after their name. If you're taking in a phone call or my chart, which is our way of emailing back and forth with patients, and you could ask a few very basic questions. Are we sure we're dealing with a Philips device? Is your device registered? Um, let me help you get that device registered. And please stop using whatever external cleaner you're sticking in there. And then lastly, they would then tie that in with a provider so they could get specific advice. The next part of the algorithm deals with what do the people that have initials after their name, how do they evaluate these patients, how do they make a quick decision, and what do they tell them? So that we are giving a very consistent message to our patient population, we are approaching them all in a similar fashion, However, we are giving very specific advice to that particular patient. Most of our medical societies design some algorithms. Dr. Mara took that a step further. She took most of what was on those other algorithms that were designed by the medical societies and we added a few things to it. So these are things looking at risk assessment, such as, are you sleepy? Because we don't want sleepy driving. Are you in a transportation or a critical injury where you cannot be sleepy? Do you have a comorbidity like cardiovascular disease, stroke, underlying pulmonary disease? And then finally, what we added to our algorithm, we happen to be positioned within a neurology institute at Cleveland Clinic. We wanted to address our patients with strokes and seizures and to make sure that they were not stopping their um, devices. So we added that to what we saw going on in the medical community as a whole. The last part of our algorithm followed up and made sure that that patient was plugged in with their provider and had adequate care and could look at medical alternatives. Then 
we took our algorithm and we wanted to put it into written form. And if you picture a large hospital system, we're talking about, uh, we have more than 70,000 employees. And for the providers talking to patients, a lot of them are primary care docs or people in other specialties that aren't familiar with what we in sleep medicine are used to. So it was quite overwhelming to get these phone calls and my chart messages and trying to figure out what to do. So we wanted to give the providers tools that they could just drop into the electronic medical record and use as reference and give to the patients. So Epic, our electronic medical record, I had recently become an Epic builder. So I'm like, hey, let's build a smart phrase. So every time a provider would type .CPAP recall, it would drop a body of information into whatever encounter we were talking about. If it was something that got handed to a patient, if it was an incoming message or an encounter note, um, it was there for uh, the provider and the patient. It listed out in words what was visually on the decision algorithm. And then the provider had a choice of you either stop your therapy or you continue your therapy based on review of that algorithm. It also included information on how to register your device with Philips. But I think the most important part of the conversation was patients wanted to know what to do. And most of the people getting these messages had no idea what to tell them. This, however, was an opportunity for me to say, hey, here's some of the things that I've been trying to converse with our patients about for years. So this was a wonderful opportunity. We had to get creative because supply overall was shrinking and shrinking quickly. Um, had people, we had to think of ways of people dusting off old CPAPs that they might have or investing their um, HSA or FSA dollars to maybe, hey, let's use a travel CPAP until you get a remediated device. Then we started looking at some of our other forms of therapy, a couple of which I listed here with positional therapy, what we do for people that are struggling with their weight, over-the-counter solutions for dealing with allergies, looking at that multimodality approach to the treatment of apnea. For dentistry, we're fortunate at Cleveland Clinic to have a model where we have a dental school and the chairman of the dental department and one other dentist, they are dealing with apnea all day, every day. And so they are physically with us within the system. And because we're on EPIC, the electronic medical record, they're embedded within the same medical record. And we are sharing information and coordinating patient care daily. So we're very blessed to have that. So we gave some initial advice on consideration for um, dental appliances. And of course, in big red, we had to do the warning about drowsy driving. And then at the very end, oops, so sorry. We did have a link going back to um, the visual algorithm. So if you're a primary care doctor sitting out there going, oh wow, all these words are overwhelming, you could click a link and it would pop open the visual algorithm to tell you what to do. At this point, like my dog trip, I was feeling pretty happy because these are really exciting tools that we were starting to use. And we embedded trackers into these communications so that we could go back and retrieve the information and see what happened with the advice over time. Okay, that job was done. Next, we've got a way of deciding what to do. And now we have to decide how in the world are we gonna get this information to our patients. We've got a big list of patients, what do we do next? There was this wonderful group of people that handle outreach campaigns. I'm like, wow, this exists? This is unbelievable. So I get goosebumps still just thinking about it. So out of our 17,000 patients who had um, a device through Cleveland Clinic Home Care, every single person got a letter, so you had something in writing. The vast majority of them had access through Epic, something called MyChart, which is a way of electronically communicating via email in a HIPAA secure fashion. So we did a MyChart message blast with the information we had put together. 
What's really neat is you can tell if somebody opened and, opened and read it or not. If you didn't open it, you got a second one. So we went down whittling away this patient population. We stopped after two because people get mad if you keep bombarding them and there's a little bit of message and alarm fatigue there. So after two, we stopped that. The group that was left, if um, you couldn't reach them by my chart, we started with a, a phone uh, blast in calling them. And so two attempts there as well. We whittled that entire population down to about 108 patients. So pretty impressive going from 17,000 down to only 108 that we were unable to reach. So that was pretty exciting too. Okay, but then here's me next. Wow, we've gotten the word out to almost 17,000. What in the world are we going to do when the phone calls and messages start coming in? Fortunately, there was a group that handled that. So they did what we started doing during the pandemic. If there's certain trigger words that you called or messaged with that went to a, a center. And there's a group of us that trained people that were answering the phones and we could train them on the algorithm. Um, we also had to set up an educational campaign to get the word out to our physicians, to our people answering the phone, to our respiratory therapists, to everyone across the enterprise. And then lastly, and this is a really neat tool, at the beginning of the pandemic, we had something called Express Care Online. And it was a group of nurse practitioners who are specifically trained to a task. And this is all they handle virtually, all day long. So we wanted to give the patient instant access to someone with credentials after their name, giving them guidance. So we did training of this group and then the call center, as they got these calls coming in, would offer an immediate visit with our nurse practitioners. And then after that visit with the nurse practitioners, or if they said, no, I don't want to do that, I want to get in with my provider that prescribed therapy, we would circle back and get them plugged in. So the loop closed at the end. Um, the other things that we did from an educational standpoint, and I'm still doing this, I actually have to go give one next week um, because we're 13 months into the mission and recall is still an issue. Um, we keep updating our educational slide decks and our um, uh, educational, um, what we call blast through internet um, education. And also we're set up in family health centers around the Ohio area. And so through teams, we're doing a lot of um, educational lectures with our primary care base to help give them guidance through this. We also had a lot of common themes and what one might think are crazy questions that kept coming in. And as we saw common themes, we would design scripts that people could use uh, in Epic and they could just drop that verbiage in very quickly and utilize it while they're communicating with the patient. Just as an example, early on in the recall, some of the communications that had to do specifically with ventilators dealt with these filters that went outside of full ventilators that you see on the right-hand side of this slide. But, like my dog Trip, that doesn't necessarily mean it needs to go on a CPAP or a BiPAP machine. So there was a lot of confusion early on and with a lot of phone calls, people clamoring saying, I have to have an inline bacterial filter for my CPAP machine. Well, they don't really belong there. And if for some reason you have to use one, there are some instructions like taking off the humidifier or it gets bogged down with water. So we designed some scripts for people that don't normally deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis of what to tell the patient and how to inform them. We would have daily huddles very quick meetings with uh, breakout groups so that we could very quickly pivot based on what was happening in a dynamic fashion. And we kept tying this back in with Phillips. Initially, it was daily meetings. Right now, we're down to weekly meetings, but this is an ongoing process because they are our partners. And over time, we're going to see what the cause of this really is. But this isn't a case where you just abandon each other. Okay, what happened in the lab? Because we have these units in the lab for titration purposes. We were fortunate in that 
half of our machines were ResMed, half of them were Philips. And so we took the Philips machines out and came up with a decision tree on what we would do with patients and prioritizing titrations. Over time, we've been able to purchase uh, more as ResMed units, and we're up to 75% of our beds um, having PAP titration capabilities. Um, in our labs in Florida, where we did not have um, any ResMed devices and you weren't able to get any, um, we came up with a plan where you would remove the humidifier using an inline bacterial filter, which took out the particulate matter that would break down from uh, the PEEPER material, um, but would not handle the off-gassing, and then you and legal would had a waiver that they would have people sign. Not ideal, but it's what we had. So then we had the ever-shrinking supply of PAP therapy. What do you do with that? Because our shelves were quickly becoming bare and resources were thin. So we had to start prioritizing. So we prioritized the patients that were on um, RAD devices, non-invasive ventilation, ventilators, and needed O2. And then beyond that, we would look individually at their comorbidities and apnea severity or if they needed to have surgery. And then when devices weren't available, we wanted to be able to direct those orders as they came in. So we partnered with our local DMEs and came in. Normally, these are highly competitive groups that fight over patient populations. I shouldn't say fight, but, um, but we've really banded together to help care for the patient population and prioritize who really needed PAP therapy. We also embedded from our electronic medical record trackers so we could find where these orders went. And for our patients who are with Cleveland Clinic for, um, as employees, we have our own insurance that mandated they get their device through our um, uh, home care company. We also partnered and very quickly got them covered for our regional DMEs. So we were able to query our smart phrase use, that dot CPAP recall, and see how it was used to get some data. Now there is nothing earth shattering in this data whatsoever. The whole purpose of pulling the data was to see did our algorithm and task force resonate with our referral base? Did they understand what was going on and were they able to use the smart phrase appropriately? So what we found for the most part was that we were successful in getting the message across where patients that were older had comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, heart failure, AFib, those patients were directed to continue use of their PAP device, and this was true in about 60% of those patients. What was interesting, though, we had added to our algorithm neurological diagnoses that we thought would be important. The smart phrase wasn't used, either not used, or people were um, not told to continue use of PAP therapy. I have a few ideas as to why, uh, but that was interesting. So we could call out where we might have not been successful and need to communicate better with certain referral bases. So our experience to date, known risk of not using therapy to treat your apnea versus a big question for risk and how we dealt with it and are currently continuing to deal with it um, as a hospital system. And very thankful for this huge team that I was able to work with and the epic tools that we're able to utilize to very quickly communicate with patients. And Cleveland Clinic Home Care, currently uh, more than 80% of our patients have um, undergone remediation where they've gotten a replacement device. And it seemed that our patients were getting devices much faster than others, and people were like, oh, is there preferential treatment? Actually, the, the system is blinded, and the FDA monitors this. No, there's not preferential treatment because we're Cleveland Clinic. The difference was that we, we found our patients, identified them quickly, and communicated that first week and got the information into their hands. They were able to very quickly register and got themselves teed up in line because it is a big queue. 
Um, currently, the in-lab titration units, they're about to submit the plan uh, to have those devices remediated, so that's still pending. I'm going to pause and segue here into the second goal for today. So something that I've been passionate about is multimodality therapy for the treatment of obstructive apnea. Because for years, it's pretty much just been, oh, elevated AHI, oh, here's a CPAP, peace out. Square pegs in a round hole. But we have other treatment options, and that's improving every day. I listed a few of these here. But some of the determining factors, you know, is it available in your area? Are there providers that can help you, help guide you, if you will, in acquiring these treatment options? The way I approach patients when they see me for the first time, I talk with them about apnea as a whole and what all of the treatment options are. I lay it out like a menu of options. And they also get it in written format and we negotiate what we think would work best for them as a starting point and what they would be comfortable in doing. What can they afford to do? All of these are important factors. The other part is finding qualified professionals. And so that's on every aspect. And this is um, something we'll talk about in a moment where trying to find people that you're comfortable communicating with. You know, we, we're lucky we've got dentists that are within our system and I can communicate with very easily. Now a concept over the next couple of years is the idea of phenotypes. In the medical literature you're going to see a lot about this and this is going to help us decide what treatment options are best for what patient population. And there's a lot of different articles out there right now, and each author seems to have a different approach based on what patient population they're looking at. This is from uh, Dr. Javahari, who did a lot of work with uh, Sleep Heart Health at OSU and in a private practice just outside of Cincinnati. And his, he's done a lot with heart failure and AFib, as well as central sleep apnea. And he was looking at the cardiovascular population and trying to look at various phenotypes. Four big groups overall that he described. In general, if they're people that have a small collapsible upper airway as the predominant um, reason for airway obstruction, these patients seem to do best with oral appliances and upper airway surgery. There are others, and like we heard about in the last lecture, where muscle tone is an issue. Those are people where things like hypoglossal nerve stimulation, myotonic targets to improve the tone, pharyngeal and, and tongue training and medications to help improve that muscle tone that has no skeletal architecture to support it. Um, the idea of a low arousal threshold. I see this not uncommonly in women that present perimenopausal with insomnia. They'll start to obstruct the airway and they're highly arousable. We need to approach that patient population, maybe including uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and or hypnotics into their treatment regimen. And then the idea of increased loop gain. If you're not familiar with that concept, some people are very sensitive to changes in airflow and there's a tendency to overreact or hyperreact to that situation. And so you'll see a, a marked increase of fast ventilation. So, and then it becomes this cyclical pattern where they'll stop breathing. Then they hyper breathe, if you will, and then they'll stop breathing again. So it's this never ending fluctuation that we need to stabilize. And so for that group, we look more at oxygen and other medications to help level out CO2 levels, CO2 being our major um, communicator between heart, lung, and brain. Another group, and this was uh, Clara Yagi at Yale, has done a lot of work with phenotypes. And this has been, um, uh, he looked at 16 different analyses and divvied it up into six different subtypes or phenotypes, if you will. And subtype A is what we classically think of. This is a younger man, obese, 
pretty sleepy, middle of the road oxygen desaturations. And this group, they're most at risk for drowsy driving and cardiovascular disease. And these are the people that we're reaching for CPAP. But there's other groups. For instance, the older man with a lot of comorbidities may do a lot of napping during the day, has a lot of oxygen desaturations, may not really respond or adhere to PAP therapy, and we need to focus on their comorbidities rather on immediately refu uh, removing the obstructive respirations. Then there's, there was the group that I was talking about earlier. So for women in the perimenopausal period, more prone to have REM-related apnea, more prone to be arousable multiple times during the night, they really struggle with PAP use. So we definitely need to look at other treatment options and adding in cognitive behavioral therapy and hypnotics if need be. Subtype D, those young people tend to be male, thinner, a lot of snoring and a lot of abrupt awakenings at night, tend not to have a lot of drops in oxygen level, and they tend to not adhere to PAP therapy. Unknown on the cardiovascular risk front, so there may be some benefit to CPAP use, but we need to really look at our other treatment options, including oral appliances in this patient population. And then subtype E and F, which concern me the most. So this is a uh, visual of a hypnogram where up top you see the sleep stages. Forgive me while I see if the pointer works. Yes. You're descending into the deeper stages of sleep here. The black is REM sleep. Here is your, they have deep oxygen desaturations, particularly in REM. Apneas and hypopneas and a high arousal threshold. These people are at very high risk for cardiovascular disease and yes, you need to get them on CPAP. This is by far gonna be the best route to go. But then there's this patient population, and I'm most interested in this patient population. They tend not to get into the deepest <laughs> stages of sleep. They do not have those profound drops in oxygen level. It's predominantly hypopneas rather than frank apneas that you're seeing. And the frequent arousals, we start seeing problems with neurocognitive dysfunction, particularly memory, mood, and concentration. I have this collection, being close to Case Western, I have this collection of patients who are professors that they've started to notice if they're having very mild cognitive issues or problems with memory. And we've studied them and if we're seeing REM related events, we work very hard, number one, at making sure they're getting enough sleep so they get that last big cycle of REM at the end of the night but that REM sleep is not interrupted, which most frequently from what I'm seeing is obstructive breathing. So if we can get that out of the equation and lengthen their sleep period to make sure they're getting enough REM, then we start seeing improvement in their daytime function. So our sleep medicine team, and this is only a small list. There's other people who are part of this team. Some of those members of the team are in the, in the vendor area. I was excited to see that. Um, I talk to my patients about being the navigator. And I'm like, please don't run away from me. If our first option doesn't work, I need to hear from you. I need to hear from you early. I need to help, help you intervene, work through whatever problems we're having, or if we need to go in a different direction. So I view myself as the navigator. But I've got a lot of partners. I'm going to go De Niro here. So if anyone remembers the circle of trust. So I, I have found that over the years, my approach with patients has been this very small circle of trust. But this goes both ways. I know dentists will have that circle of trust issue with the sleep doctors, ENT, has that issue with us as sleep doctors. The sleep doctors are suspicious of what happens when they go to ENT and dentistry. You know, there's multiple fears there. Are they going to disappear and I'll never see them again? Do I lose my referral base? Um, 
do they have a bad experience with whatever therapy is pursued, whether it's PAP, dental appliance, a surgical option, and then throw in the towel. So for years, I found myself making that circle of trust smaller and smaller and smaller to where there's very few people that I felt willing to let see my patients. Now that may be fine for my practice as a whole, but for our field, and I'm starting to look at the population as a whole, I need to have a different outlook. So now what I'm trying to do is educate, get the word out, and partner. Hence my partnership in uh, being on the clinical advisory board with a dental appliance company. Um, partnerships with our um, industry friends in the PAP therapy world. Working with our ear, nose, and throat doctors. Uh, working with our um, device people, looking at innovative ways of approaching and having us come together in meetings like this so that we can eliminate these silos and bring everyone together. And then of course, being a tech person, I want to be able to track that data long term with our um, adherence models. And I want to be able to track these patients long term. We don't want to lose them where they try something and then they disappear for five years and come back and say, I had this horrible experience and I just didn't want to approach it, but now I'm falling asleep at the wheel. So at the Cleveland Clinic, what we're doing, and I'm working with um, Louis Kazaglis, my buddy that contacted me at five o'clock in the morning on the recall, where he's developing a um, OSA care path. So when someone enters the care path, they're not just entering the care path, getting set up on CPAP, and you continue that or you don't, whatever. This is their therapy as a whole. We're trying to develop something that looks at all therapeutic options, and we're able to track those patients over time. And a big part of that is also tracking what's in it for the patient, because they all come with a specific set of goals. And are we addressing those goals for that patient? You know, we have these numbers we try to go for, and did I reduce the AHI? But it goes beyond that. How did we affect that person on a day-to-day -day basis? All right, so I'm going to pause there. 